Multiple sclerosis is not genetic in the way that cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease are genetic, but there are various genes that increase the risk of MS, the most famous of which is HLA-DRB1-1501. If you have this allele or gene version, you have a roughly threefold increased risk of MS. If you have two copies, you have a roughly eightfold increased risk. But what does this gene do and what does it teach us about MS? Let's take a deep dive and remember what Dr. Mehmet Oz said, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So to start, this chart clearly shows MS is to some extent genetic, and it shows the risk of MS in people with various relatives with the disease. For instance, if you have an identical twin with MS, your risk is very high, around 25%. Not shown here, if you have two parents, both with MS, your risk is around 12%. If you have a fraternal twin, the risk is about 2 to 5%. The female child of someone with MS has around a 3% risk for a male child, it's around 1%, just because males have a lower risk overall. If you have an aunt or uncle with the disease, your risk is about 1%. If you have a cousin with MS, it's only 0.4%, not much higher than the general population in the United States, which is around 1 in 350 to 1 in 500. And a lot of the genetic risk has to do with these genes, the HLA or human leukocyte antigen genes, which are on chromosome 6 and arranged in a row, and they code for the proteins which make up the major histocompatibility complex, which as I'll show in a moment, is involved in how our immune system interacts with the environment. These genes are highly polymorphic, very variable. In fact, no two humans, aside from identical twins, have identical HLA genes, which is why organ transplantation is difficult and often requires immunosuppression. Now we're gonna focus on this specific area, HLA-DRB1, because it's most associated with risk of MS but various HLA genes are associated with different autoimmune diseases, for instance, with ankylosing spondylitis, an autoimmune disease that can cause back pain. Almost everyone with the condition has a certain variant of HLA-B27. HLA-DR4 is linked to rheumatoid arthritis, and HLA-DR3 is linked to autoimmune hepatitis, Sjogren syndrome, and type 1 diabetes. So let's take a closer look at the specific allele that is the so-called multiple sclerosis gene, which is hla -DR4. DRB1-1501. We know it's associated with MS in essentially all studied populations. A lot of research in MS is in European populations, but this gene has been linked to MS in Caucasians, Asians, Middle Easterns, and African Americans. And according to one meta-analysis, they calculated a p-value of 10 to the negative 1900, an extremely small number for this to occur by chance. So the association is very clear. Now there are some individual studies on Chinese, Iranian, African Americans, and Brazilian populations that did not show an association, but my interpretation is this is just due to small sample size. The link between this gene or this allele and MS is extraordinarily strong. For instance, in Sweden, about 31% of people without MS have at least one copy of this allele. Now you have two copies of the gene, one from mom and one from dad, so you have two chances to get this allele, and you have at least one copy in 31% without MS, but in 61% of people with MS, so it's twice as prevalent in people with MS. And what does this gene do? What does this allele do? It causes more expression of this protein. So if you have HLA-DRB1-1501 as compared to other variants, you get more expression of the HLA-DRB1 protein. Now, of course, we care about this protein in antigen-presenting cells, the cells that have the major histocompatibility complex. However, interestingly, HLA proteins can also be expressed in the central nervous system, including the oligodendrocytes, which are the myelin-producing cells. So maybe there's some direct central nervous system effects that we don't fully understand. And just to make this even more clear, these are various studies looking at the frequency of hla -DR rb one in cases, people with multiple sclerosis, the white bars, compared to controls, people without MS, the dark bars, and you can see in 
every single study shown here, people with MS have a higher likelihood of having this gene. Sometimes the difference is small, not statistically significant, but the overall trend is extremely clear. This gene is definitely linked to MS. So we know that HLA-DRB1 is one of the proteins that makes up the major histocompatibility complex too, but what is that? What is the MHC2? Well, we know that it's composed from genes on chromosome 6 that make various HLA proteins that complex together together and form a transmembrane protein. And we know that it binds to peptides or antigens and it helps to bind helper T cells or CD4 positive T cells. And I'll show a diagram on the next slide. And we know that a strong interaction between MHC2 and the peptide it's binding to and the T cell receptor promotes a Th1 or T helper cell type 1 response, which is the form of inflammation that we see in multiple sclerosis. So I'll show you the diagram. Here we see an antigen presenting cell. This could be, for instance, a macrophage that chomps up a foreign protein. It grabs the protein, it assembles the major histocompatibility complex type 2, and it has the protein here, which then binds to the T cell receptor, and this is a C CD4 positive or helper T cell, and the CD4 molecule helps to facilitate this interaction. And if there's a strong interaction, it's going to facilitate this T cell to differentiate into a T helper cell type 1, which is associated with inflammation in multiple sclerosis. Now, what are these antigen presenting cells? They're often macrophages, but they can also be B lymphocytes, the cells which make antibodies, or dendritic cells. So I will propose opposed to a mechanism by which this allele or gene variant, HLA-DRB1-1501, might increase the risk of MS. First, it causes you to have more HLA-DRB1 protein. Also, the specific properties of this protein increase activation of autoreactive CD4 positive T cells specific for myelin antigens. In other words, proteins in myelin, components of the fatty sheath, which is the target of multiple sclerosis. One example of such a protein is MBP, or myelin basic protein. This shows an interaction between myelin basic protein on top and HLA-DRB1-1501. And you can see they bind very tightly because of the individual amino acid residues, which are hydrophobic. So even if you don't know an organic chemistry, take my word for it, that these residues, isoleucine, leucine, valine, tyrosine, phenylalanine, are hydrophobic or fatty, and they tend to bind to each other. So the individual residues, the individual amino acids in this specific protein produced by this specific gene bind myelin basic protein more tightly and presumably stimulate T cell receptors more, causing them to differentiate into T helper cells type 1, driving inflammation against myelin, causing the symptoms of MS. And of course, in reality, the pathogenesis may be influenced by other factors as well as shown in this diagram. So let's say you have an antigen presenting cell, let's say a B cell or a macrophage in the thymus where cells like T cells are maturing, and you can see the major histocompatibility complex type 2 and we have our specific version of HLA-DRB1 within this, and it has a peptide, and it's binding to a T cell receptor, activating a helper T cell. But you have these naive T cells, and there are other aspects of immune regulation. For instance, you have regulatory T cells and other aspects of the immune system keeping things in check. But maybe you have another provoking factor, such as Epstein-Barr virus infection, which seems to interfere on immune systems system regulation, and then you may get activated memory T cells, which may cross the blood-brain barrier and cause inflammation and then the symptoms of MS. We'll return to this allele in a moment, but I want to take a brief digression to talk about a few miscellaneous topics, one of which is vitamin D. It's well known that low vitamin D is linked to risk of MS, and amongst people with MS, those who have lower vitamin D have a worse prognosis on average, having more attacks and more new MRI lesions. Interestingly, this gene, the promoter region, which is involved in the transcription of HLA-DRB1 into ribonucleic acid, which is later 
translated into protein is responsive to the hormone vitamin D. It actually has a vitamin D response element. So people think maybe this is the mechanism by which vitamin D may be involved in potentially reducing the risk of MS or controlling MS. Now, my personal opinion is overall, there's less and less evidence that vitamin D has anything to do with MS and may be simply associated with MS due to confounding with sunlight exposure. There's all kinds of evidence that ultraviolet radiation has very interesting effects on regulating the immune system. However, this seems too good to be coincidental that the gene most linked to MS risk is responsive to vitamin D. Just food for thought there. The exact interaction with vitamin D and the gene and how it links to MS risk is not fully understood. Another thing that's interesting that I mentioned before is that even though these HLA proteins are primarily thought to be produced in antigen-presenting cells, they're also in the brain. And people with MS who have this specific allele, HLA-DRB1-1501, have more expression of this protein, HLA-DRB1, in their brain. You can see the staining showed here. Does this have anything to do with MS? I'm not sure one way or the other. The last thing is, obviously I'm focusing on one allele, but there are various genes that are linked to MS. In fact, in some cases, mutation in a single letter in the book that is our DNA, a single nucleotide, and this is known as a single nucleotide polymorphism or variation in a single letter of the genome, can be significantly associated with MS risk. And a lot of these mutations are within HLA genes, and it can get quite complicated where getting combinations of specific HLA variants can be associated with MS or associated with a lower risk of MS. And these are three such single nucleotide polymorphisms. And you can see the odds ratio or increased risk relative to control of approximately three, meaning change one letter of your genome, you have a three times higher risk of MS. Now, the question you probably had since the beginning of the video is, does the gene really matter? I already have multiple sclerosis. Does it affect my prognosis? Is MS with the gene more aggressive? And my answer is probably not significantly. Some studies do show a wink to an earlier age of onset in people with this allele. In other words, they were slightly younger when they got multiple sclerosis, although there are really mixed results in different studies. Some studies show more demyelination in the cortex or surface of the brain, and one study shows more lesions in the spinal cord, which is associated with more disability. So just to show that study, this is a Dutch study, and they looked at carriers, people with this allele on the left side, and people who did not have the allele on the right side, and the number of spinal cord lesions you can see in the y-axis. And you can see the median of four was twice as high as the median of two spinal cord lesions in non-carriers, but there was quite a bit of overlap here. However, my overall interpretation of the data is there's no clear association with overall clinical progression. For example, take a look at this cross-sectional study looking at people with and without the allele, and they have very similar characteristics. There was slightly more disability in people with the allele, an EDSS or expanded disability status scale of 3.2 versus 2.9 in those without the allele, but that's a very small difference. This is a 0 to 10 scale, and it was probably driven by other factors such as increased disease duration, 15 years in people with the allele, versus 13 years in those without, and slightly older average age, 46 versus 45, just not too impressive here. This is some longitudinal data looking at people with relapsing remitting MS and seeing how many reached an EDSS of 4 or moderate disability. And you can see with and without the gene, it was about the same. These are survival curves looking at everyone who started off with an EDSS of less than four and seeing how many still had an EDSS less than four by 14 years. And you can see it was roughly the same, around 60 to 70%. So overall, I would agree with the claim made by Professor George Jelinek in the book Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis, which is that genetics definitely influence your risk of getting MS but it's
it's not so clear that they affect the actual prognosis. That may be due to chance and lifestyle factors, and hopefully that provides some reassurance maybe to someone who have his MS and has a parent or other relative with a disease that was more aggressive. Your history may be very different, and indeed, I have quite a few patients who had parents with very aggressive, severe MS who have actually done quite well, particularly in the modern era. One other point I want to make is that I really wouldn't recommend getting this genetic test outside of a research study because it doesn't provide any useful information and could actually be quite misleading. It can't be used to diagnose MS. After all, it's present in 30% of the Swedish population without MS in the study that I showed you earlier. And I definitely wouldn't recommend this test in a relative of someone with MS because again, it could cause a lot of unnecessary anxiety or even false reassurance. Please let, let me know if you have any questions in the comments below or if you have suggestions for future videos.